Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Contemplation. We're coming your way from the studios of MTA International in London. My name is Ibrahim Kwatin. In this edition of Contemplation, we look at the message of Islam as a universal um, religion. Muslims and Christians both state that their religion's message is universal. So how is the message of Islam applicable to the whole of mankind? And does Islam recognize the teachings of Christianity? With me in the studio to look at the issue is Jonathan Bartawat. Jonathan Bartawat uh, was an agnostic who uh, converted into the fold of Islam Ahmediyat a, a couple of years um, ago. Uh, Jonathan, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What do we mean <coughs> if um, uh, we say a, a religion is universal? Well, all, all religion is universal in a, in a sense because there is only one God. Um, there is only one core of religious teaching. And in this sense, I Islam and all of the prophets said that, came to bring the same message, which was to pray to God, uh, fulfill the rights of humanity, um, many of them to fast, to pay charity, uh, to honor the holy books, the holy scriptures. Uh, but the core of all religion is essentially uh, what Jesus said, love thy God, <coughs> love thy neighbor. So in this sense, all true religions, which essentially you can tell that on the basis of um, their scriptures and, and you can examine the scriptures and see that truth in them, all of these religions are universal. However, they did not all, they were not all given for all of mankind. Mm. It was, God revealed religion in stages. So the message was always the same core, the same beauty, the same truth, However, God revealed it gradually and gradually and developed it until it was able to be globally spread for all of mankind. And in this sense, all of, uh, you can look at it as a metaphor almost, Ibrahim, which is that religion is like one core channel or one core river um, going down a mountainside. And all religion has that same channel, that same path. Uh, however, also many, for different times, for different places, different streams ran into it, different streams came out of it. But the central core is true. And the key question is, at which point did that universal religion become universal for all of humanity? And we can come on to this and go into it in more detail, uh, but the essential element of this is that up until Islam, or the revelation given to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him, we can see in all of the scriptures before that point that they were being allocated to particular people at particular times. The religion was one, it was, it was, it was common and united, but it was for different people at different times at different places. And it reached its pinnacle, its height, and was perfected at the time of Muhammad. And in that sense, that is the true sense of universality. Mm. The same message, but for everybody uh, in a perfected form. Mm. Right. Now, let's um, narrow it down to Islam, basically, as a universal religion. Both um, uh, Islam and Christianity, the major religions, um, stay claim to universality. Yes. Now, um, what makes Islam? You are a Muslim, I don't know what um, attracted you to Islam, but what makes Islam, in your view, and uh, from the Quran, a universal religion? So, uh, as I said, I think the, the key question to really ask, looking at it from an agnostic point of view, mm. is you have to look at it very objectively and say, the religion of Islam, does it share the same qualities, the same principles, the same practices as the other religions? And in fact, do they all share that same basic core? Can I see all of them reflecting beauty throughout each of them? Um, and when you do, then you begin to come to a, a point where you say, actually, all of these religions of a God are from God, and I cannot choose one messenger, reject another messenger. I can't have Moses, peace be upon him, but reject Adam. I can't have Muhammad, peace be upon him, and reject Jesus. And when you read the scriptures in light of this and you look at the core, then you begin to realize that actually God takes that very, very seriously. To, ex to, to reject a messenger of God is the thing that Jesus warned the tribes of Israel about, that Moses warned the tribes of Israel about, that Muhammad warned the tribes of Arabia about. And the particular element of the beauty of Islam is it continues this path. And Muhammad warned the Arabs and then the Muslims and said, you must accept all messengers who brought you this one core religion and accept me as a messenger. And I'll just read you a quote mm. of the Quran, which, which shows you this. 
So it's from chapter 4, verse 150, depending on if you count Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. If, it's a, if you do, then it'll be 151. And it says, A'udhu Billah min shaitan ar-Rajim. I seek refuge with Allah from shaitan the rejected, in the name of Allah the gracious, the merciful. Those who believe in Allah and his messengers and say, we believe in some and disbelieve in others and we seek to choose a way in between, such are disbelievers in truth. But those who believe in God and his messengers and make no distinction between any of them, to them will God give their full wages. So Muhammad was saying, accept Adam, accept Noah, accept Ibrahim, accept Joseph, Jacob, Moses, Jesus, and accept me. Don't, don't reject any of those scriptures. Don't reject any of those prophets and do not reject me. And if you look at it from this sense, in a purely objective sense, why would you accept Jesus and reject Muhammad? And if you do, then are you not falling foul of the same teaching which Jesus brought, which is never reject somebody from God? Mm. This is one element. Another very brief element is Islam talks about the perfection of religion. So in, in Surah Al-Baqarah, in, in the second verse of the Holy Quran, a chapter of the Holy Quran, Allah says that on this day I have perfected your religion. And essentially he is saying that it has been the same core, the same beauty, but now I have shown it in all of its splendor, all of its beauty. And, and not only were the seeds planted, but now you can see the tree. And this is the result of the seeds that were planted by Jesus and Moses. And now this is the fulfillment of those prophecies in, in, in the perfected state of religion. Um, so in this sense, Islam is the pinnacle of religion. But another meaning of Islam used in the Holy Quran is that Adam brought Islam as well. And mm. Islam existed before Muhammad. Jesus brought Islam in a sense, in the sense that Islam also refers to the core teachings. Mm. But it was perfected in the Holy Quran. Mm. Right. And why would you, the, the key message of God is why would you reject any book? Why would you reject any messenger? Right. The uh, proponents of um, the universality of Islam's message um, cite prayer as an example, the way Muslims pray. If you travel from here, to um, Afghanistan, if you travel from here to any country in the world where Muslims are, are worshipping, despite the few doctrinal differences, Muslims have a way of praying. Everybody knows that the forehead eventually goes to the ground. Yes. See, so they, they see this as a sign of universality. Do you think this, is, th this also amounts to a sign of universality of Islam? Yes, very much. Um, if you look, for example, at different religions, um, let's say different religions, because I've said that in reality there is no such thing as different religions, there's only one. Um, and that is the religion brought by all the messengers. But if you look at the Holy Bible for Christians, for example, if they look at the verses of, of, of Jesus when he was praying the day before his, his um, crucifixion, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it talks about the way in which he prayed, mm. and it talks about him on his knees, he doesn't stand, he doesn't sit, he goes onto his knees and bending and, and essentially prostrating. And if you look at, at the way image is described that Jesus prayed, then in reality, um, most respectfully, then that is much closer to how you will see Muslims will go onto their knees and they will prostrate and put their heads to the floor. In the same way that Jesus, it is, peace be upon him, it is most um, intimate with God. That is how he, he prayed and he called his disciples from sleep and said, get up and pray, pray with me. So in, in this way, you can see that all of these, as I said, streams that mm. flow into tributaries into the central river of religion, you see this in all of those. And, and this is, um, in that sense, Islam is, is, is almost bringing all of that together in the most perfect way. But the way for the viewers to know this is to try this themselves. And, and when they do try prostration and they do put their heads to the floor, then that is, that is a true test mm. of whether that is the perfected form of prayer. And it's, I, I would humbly suggest for the viewers that that is actually when they'll find themselves closest to God. In, in Islam's claim to universality, others have questioned um, certain injunctions. Um, jihad that though you claim, um, the, the, the question is, though you claim that Islam is a universal religion, when it comes to certain terminologies, jihad, the interpretations are different. Some would think that um, jihad means taking the sword, going to kill uh, uh, other people, but I, the, 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 um, the spiritual head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Hazrami Zamashur Ahmed, and the Ahmadiyya um, community itself, 
um, has distanced um, themselves from such um, um, teachings. How, how do you react to that if you are talking about the universality of Islam? Others say this, other Muslims say no. So I think there's two, there's two key points. The first is what does jihad mean in its entirety um, given in the time of Islam? And this still operates today. But then secondly, how do Muslims practice jihad today? So the first question is what does jihad mean? And jihad essentially is, is very tightly prescribed use of essentially self-defense. Self-defense primarily when you are attacked by an, an enemy force. Uh, and, and primarily when you're persecuted because of your religion uh, or when you're stopped from practicing your religion um, or, or if there's a tyrant and a dictator in your, in your, in your nation and, and as a result of all of the methods have failed and because of that oppression. So to give an, an equivalent example of whether or not people would agree with jihad, they just need to ask themselves if they were, if I can give an example, if they were in a village in Africa, in, let's say in Ghana, um, and let's say they're in, the, in, in, a, in a rural area and an enemy group of soldiers attacks this village. Let's use the example of Nigeria mm. and we know there are terrorist forces in northern Nigeria. You're in this village, you have your family with you, your family are in your, in your, in your home, um, you see your children playing, then you tell your children to go inside because there's an enemy force coming. Will you let those soldiers enter into your house and kill your family? Or would you use self-defense to stop those soldiers from coming in and killing, killing your family? What would be more pleasing to God? Would it be pleasing to God to, to let, God forbid, soldiers come and kill your wife and children? No, that would be a cowardly act and that would displease God and, and the consequences would be terrible. Mm. The, the righteous thing to do is to use self-defense. That is the origin of jihad. That's the jihad that Muhammad practiced, peace be upon him. But now, is anybody attacking Muslims because of their religion? Um, certainly there are many conflicts going on in the Arab world, but if you look at them, they're political, they're economic. Um, in, all in all cases, nobody is attacking Muslims purely on the basis of their faith. As a result, then you should respond in like manner. So if somebody attacks you with a sword, Ibrahim, then it's your right to defend them with a sword. If somebody attacks you with a pen, you can't take a sword out and attack them. You have to respond in the same way. If somebody writes a letter against you defaming you then you should take up the pen mm. and say well no you are sadly mistaken this is the truth so now the jihad as it is as it has always been a principle of self-defense is proportionality it's like for like so now islam is attacked with the pen the true jihad is to respond with the media social media writing of articles mm. writing of books this is the true essence of jihad mm. Mm. You so uh, generally how, how do we change people's um, negative perceptions about Islam, which has crept deep into um, society? I think that the, the best way to do it is, is the same way that the Holy Prophet Muhammad did it. And if you look at his practices and how he behaved, <clears throat> then he transformed people's views of Islam. Because in the early days then, the, the Arabs would say to him that you are, God forbid, a madman, a poet, or, or that you are taking the youth and you're looking to corrupt our society. Uh, he didn't respond with violence. <clears throat> he didn't say, this is blasphemy and I'm going to kill you. He responded with such humility and such love. And so, for example, there was a, a woman who would tip rubbish on him on a regular basis. And many, many people will know this already. Uh, he would receive this <coughs> rubbish being poured upon him. Um, however, one day he walked past, the rubbish wasn't poured upon him. And what did he do? Did he celebrate and say, oh, thankfully, this person stopped and they've passed away? No, he went to their home and he inquired and said that this woman who would pour rubbish upon me, uh, why has she stopped? What's wrong? And he found out that she was ill. And he came to her and he was full of compassion for her because of her illness. So somebody abused him, somebody attacked him, somebody sought to dishonor him, and he responded with love. And when people saw this, this is when people would come to Islam. And this is when people would change their behavior. Because they would see that no matter what they did to this, to this man, to this, this servant of God, they could never get him to, to give up his principles. He would always remain in such peace and with such love. And this has happened all the way throughout. The battle, of mm. the battle when, when the Holy Prophet of Islam entered Mecca, 
with 10,000 forces, the Arabs thought that they were going to be massacred because this was their practice and they had massacred the Muslims and they'd tortured them and they'd put hot stones on them, they'd ripped their women apart with camels. But what happened was Muhammad, peace be upon him, entered Mecca and he said that today I forgive you um, like the brothers of Yusuf, like the brothers of Joseph, the, the biblical story of forgiveness. Um, and this, this was what the impact was. And then all of Arabia converted from that stage on, in reality, mm -hmm. almost like a tidal wave. And it is because of that practice. So it's not with the sword <coughs> that we respond, but it is in the, in the model of the Holy Prophet, which is with humility. Mm -hmm. Now let's come to uh, Jonathan Batawat as a person. Um, what we are told that the, there were certain elements of uh, universality of the message of Islam that attracted you eventually to Islam, Ahmadiyyat. Um, what are some of the elements, universal elements of Islam that attracted you to, to, to Islam eventually? Yes, so it is a, it's a very simple thing, which is um, it has to begin and it has to end with God. Um, you know, to talk about the word, use the words of Jesus or what we believe are the words of Jesus from the Bible, he, he said that God, that God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And in Islam, it's, there's a, a very famous saying of, of Muhammad, and it's also in the Holy Quran, that nothing shall remain except the face of thy Lord. Mm. And Allah is one, and God is one. And this is what Jesus said, this is what Muhammad said. And so if you are in a position where you're looking to choose a religion, you can't do it for any other reason. You can't do it for Ibrahim, you can't do it for Jonathan, you can't do it for your friends, you can't do it for your local area to, to, to become famous or to get status or to get a job. You can't do it for marriage, you can't do it for anything. You can only do it because you have come to believe that God Almighty, the Glorious, wants you to make that choice. So for, my, for myself, in my own humble efforts, I, I investigated the scriptures, I read the Bible, um, I read the Quran, I read the Taoist books and the Buddhist books, and this is what many people will do. And when they do, <clears throat> they realize that if they already believe in God, that these messages are from God, and they know their Lord when they read these words. This is what the Holy Quran says, that tell, give this message to the people of the book and they will recognize their Lord in these words, to paraphrase. Um, and to give you a very beautiful quote mm. of the Quran on this topic, because I, I prayed in churches, not, not as a Christian, but as a, someone who would enjoy God, uh, the glorious. So there's a very beautiful qu quote here, which is again, for, well, this is chapter five, verse 46, in the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. And Allah says in the Quran, we cause Jesus, son of Mary, peace be upon him, to follow in their footsteps, confirming that which was re revealed before him and we bestowed on him the gospel, where is, wherein is a guidance and a light, confirming that which was revealed before it in the Torah, a guidance and an admonition to those who are pious. <clears throat> so people in Ghana, when they hear that, and in, a, in a, other countries around the world, especially for those who are Christian, they hear about their, their, the anointed one, Christ, the Messiah, being talked of in the most beautiful way and of his book, the good news, the, the gospel, being described as a guidance and a light. And for those Jews who hear the book of the Torah being described as, as a guidance and an admonition for the righteous, then you begin to think to yourself, well, if, if, if the books that I've read of the messengers are talked of in such a loving way and, they are, and I am told that I must follow mm -hmm. them, then how can I reject this book? Well, 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 were, you, were you surprised that you, know, you uh, were looking for information, you were looking for the truth for your soul, and then you happened to find out um, Jesus Christ and peace and blessings of Allah be on him being comprehensively mentioned in the Holy Quran. Apart from Jesus Christ, other prophets, you, you also found voluminous information about them in the Holy Quran. W were you surprised? Yes, very much, very much. And it is a wonderful thing because it is in many ways what you hope for because you don't, you, many people will say to themselves, especially in the West, either I will accept all of the religions as being from God or, or I cannot accept one and reject others because, uh, or the messengers, all of the messengers of God, because how can I accept Jesus and reject Muhammad? How can I accept Muhammad and reject Moses? 
And so it is a really beautiful thing when you find that actually you do not have to give up Jesus. You don't have to give up Muhammad. You don't have to give up Moses. But God says you must accept all of them. And, and I would say a really important thing is for Christians, for example, to go back and read the early messages of Jesus. If I can just give a brief quote from Jesus from the Bible, <coughs> because often Christians will think, well, I'm a Christian and I've accepted the good news of the New Testament, and that means I need to accept the Old Testament, reject the Old Testament. But this goes against what Jesus said. And Jesus said that you must accept the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, you accept all of those prophets. And naturally, you then accept Muhammad, because Muhammad's mentioned in there as well. But I'll just give you a quote from Matthew number five. And Jesus said, do not, peace be upon him, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. The law is the law of Moses. Mm. I didn't come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. Because I tell you with certainty that until heaven and earth disappear, not one letter or one stroke of a letter will disappear from the law until everything has been accomplished. So whoever sets aside one of the least of these commandments of the Old Testament, mm. one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom from heaven. So this means that as Christians, <clears throat> you must accept those messages of the, of the Old Testament. Mm. And when you accept those teachings of the Old Testament, then you find yourself repeatedly being told, don't just accept Jesus, accept those who came before him and accept all of the teachings that they brought, all of the mm. law. And when you look at that law and you realize that Jesus lived and died as an Orthodox Jew, and just picture that, the way that he had, would have had his beard, the way that he would have prayed, the way he would have accepted and taught, followed all the teachings of Moses, that bears such similarity to the teachings of Muhammad, then in reality to accept Jesus means you must accept the Old Testament and to accept all of those messengers. And then naturally you ask yourself, well, can I reject Muhammad mm. now that I've taken that step and I've accepted all of these messengers? And when you read the gospel, read the Holy Quran, and it talks about all of those messengers in such beauty and such love, then you find yourself that in reality you, you really can't. Mm. And then you must accept all of them. Right. Now, looking at the two religions' um, claim to universality, um, Muslims believe in Jesus Christ. May the peace and blessings of Allah uh, be on him. And uh, there are a lot of um, um, quotations in the Quran that su supports um, that assertion. Uh, but unfortunately, Christians um, don't believe. But before that, um, 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 Muslims believe that uh, Jesus Christ is uh, one of the mightiest messengers of God. Uh, they also believe that he is the Messiah. They also believe in his miraculous birth and so on and so forth. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, Christians don't believe in the holy prophet of Islam, Muhammad, uh, the peace and blessings of Allah be uh, on him. Looking at the, um, their claim to universality vis-a-vis -vis these um, differences, uh, how do you react to that? So it's quite clear that Jesus brought a message which was from God. He was a true messenger of God. That much, most humbly, is, 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 is very hard and, and very uh, bold, slightly unintelligent to, to seek to deny Jesus' prophethood and his, his origins from God. <coughs> However, if you look closely at what he said to, the, to, his, to his followers, and you see a very important point. I'm going to read this mess passage of the Bible, and I, I won't comment on it until after I've read it, and I'll leave it to the viewers for a moment to, to make their own minds up about who Jesus came for. So in, in Matthew number nine, Jesus said, in the name of God, the gracious, the merciful, these were the 12 whom Jesus sent out after he had given them these instructions. Don't, don't turn on the road that leads to the Gentiles and don't enter Samaritan towns. Instead, go to the lost sheep of the nation of Israel. As you go, make this announcement, the kingdom from heaven is near. Jesus is saying, don't go to the Gentiles. Uh, the Gentiles were those who, who were particularly not circumcised or, or were not Jewish. Um, those who were not classed as, officially as believers. And don't enter the Samaritan town. Samaritan towns were another form of faith at that time. Only go to the lost sheep of Israel. This is one quote. The next quote from Matthew 15 is the story of a of a woman who came to Jesus and said, help my child. She was a Canaanite child, okay, uh, woman, and help her child. She said as follows, a Canaanite woman from that territory came and began to shout, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. 
the prophet David, peace be upon him. My daughter is severely demon possessed. But he, Jesus, peace be upon him, didn't answer her at all. He replied, I was sent only to the lost sheep mm. of the nation of Israel. Then she came and fell down before him saying, Lord, help me. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the puppies or the dogs, depending on the translation. This is a Canaanite woman, therefore a non-Jew, uh, not from the tribes of Israel, asking for Jesus' help. And he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, based upon the, uh, the 12 children um, that were scattered. Mm. Uh, and you'll see this in the biblical stories of mm. Nebuchadnezzar, who scattered the tribes of Israel across the world. He came only for this purpose. <coughs> so Jesus is answering the question here. And people might say, well, Israel, is it a metaphorical thing to refer to those who are f saved by the belief in Jesus? Well, quite clearly, this woman believed in Jesus. She's saying to him, Lord, son of David. If that's not the language of a believer or someone who believes in Jesus, then what is it? So Israel isn't just a metaphorical status to those who have faith in Jesus, because this is a woman who was Canaanite, non-Jew, but seemed to believe in Jesus' claim. But Jesus responded to this and said, no, you may well place that faith upon me, but if you are not from the tribes of Israel, I can't help you. So in this sense, Jesus was quite clearly limited in what he had been told to do and sent by God. And it's very hard uh, to objectively, with respect, um, say otherwise, based upon these teachings. This is different, as I've said, to the teachings of Islam. Um, again, the same message, but of a universal scope where, mm. where God said, I perfected your message, uh, but also he referred to Muhammad as being a mercy for all of mankind. Jesus was a mercy for the lost tribes of Israel. Muhammad was a mercy for all of mankind. Um, so quite clearly the messages themselves are clear on this. Very briefly, if you look back to Deuteronomy, then you also see teachings given to, Ju to Moses in which uh, Muhammad was referred to. And quite clearly the way in which he was referred to was being a prophet who had come. And in this sense, Christians have to accept Moses. They must accept Deuteronomy. And by extension, you must accept Muhammad. By extension, you must accept the Quran. Must as a matter of, of conscience for everybody, but, but we need to do it in good faith. But unfortunately, well. many Christians are not aware of these elements of um, universality, you know, how Islam also uh, projects, you know, a certain aspects of Christianity in a very positive um, way. Um, is, is it that uh, Muslims um, have, have, haven't done uh, well to uh, visibly project s some of these teachings to Christians? Yes, uh, yes, most certainly. Um, I think the answer to this question is yes. Uh, and also there's a prophecy um, of the coming of Jesus Christ, which is very important to think about. But just before I come to that, Ibrahim, if okay. I may, um, you, you Christians will at this point be saying in their homes as they listen to this, they will say, well, no, what he says is wrong because Jesus said, I am the way, I am the light, I yeah. am the truth. And so if Jesus was the light and the truth, then Muhammad can't be. And what I say today here on the sofa can't be as well. And, and I must therefore be making it up and Jesus was the truth <coughs> and therefore everything else is dark, <coughs> everything else is false. That is attractive, seemingly attractive from when you, when you look at it on that, with respect, superficial level. But uh, how do you reconcile Jesus saying that when he has already said that you must accept all of the law? So he is the truth, but he's saying that all of the previous prophets brought the truth you because you, say, you have to accept them. So this wasn't an exclusive truth because Jesus was saying that the law was the truth. I've come to fulfill it. We've been told our time is up and we hope that uh, we have more time to continue with this um, interesting um, subject. So I've been talking to Jonathan Butterworth, who was an agnostic but has um, converted to Islam, um, Ahmadiyya, on the subject of the universality of Islam. So till we come your way, same time again next week, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuhu.